guys. Welcome to Weightlifting Life, your new favorite podcast. I am Greg Everett, and with me is the lovely and talented Ursula Garza. Uh, Ursula was the person who f- was finally able to talk me into doing a podcast, so here we are. Uh, people have been asking me to do one of these for I don't know how many years, and I've said no every single time because I had zero interest in it. It's like having another uh, set of homework that I didn't want to do, uh, you know, being busy enough as it is. And, and of course the fact that there are about 5,000 weightlifting related podcasts already floating around in the ether. But, uh, like I said, Ursula was the one who convinced me to do it because I figured with her, it would be the greatest podcast on earth. Uh, and so we're going to put that, uh, that's what I was to the test. That's, yeah. that's exactly what I was thinking. You know, it's born of the, that conversation. We're just driving in the car and, we're talking, and I'm like, other people really should get to hear this. <laughs> yeah, you and then, think, and that, then Greg noted that once most they of the start hearing it, you might change. About, yeah, we probably couldn't put in a podcast, anyways, but we're yeah. gonna try. Well, yeah, we'll we'll largely be doing a, a Q and A format um, to best serve the people, but we'll throw in some occasional guests if we're uh, incredibly interested in them. Uh, rather than just trying to scramble to get any other human being we can find to uh, fill airtime. Um, and at least uh, for now, we're going to be posting every other week because we're busy doing actual weightlifting stuff, which, of course, is uh, the story behind the name of this podcast, which we'll be getting to uh, momentarily. Um, make sure you submit your questions to us, catalystathletics.com slash podcast. Uh, we will read all of them. We will not choose the ones that are stupid. Uh, so make sure you post some good questions. Um, and when I say stupid, I don't mean simple or beginner oriented. Those are not stupid questions. You can ask questions about the most basic things of weightlifting if that's what you need to know about. When I say stupid, I mean don't send us questions trying to stir up controversy about nonsense elements of weightlifting and that sort of thing, because those will be deleted shortly after we spend some time making fun of you privately. Um, <laughs> answering the question amongst ourselves. <laughs> right. Yeah. Answering the question in a manner that will never, ever be appropriate for public consumption. Uh, so Ursula, real quick, why don't you just give people a quick background on yourself uh, since... Uh, I don't think enough people in the weightlifting world are familiar enough with you, and we're going to help them be better people by knowing more about you. Okay, well, um, I was originally an athlete and competed from 1987, and my career as a senior athlete ended in 2000. And during that time, from 92 to 96, I was on the world team or the national team competing at the world championships. So I had a you know competitive career. I won nationals and stuff like that a couple of times. So I had a competitive career as a as a weightlifter, and then um, started coaching, just kind of like a lot of us do, incidentally, in 90, the end of 92, which was the first year that I made a world team. So I mean, obviously, I was well equipped to coach people, being facetious, um, <laughs> and. Better equipped than a lot of people out there. Well, like and, and the first girl I coached was just super talented, and she made a world team. And then then I started learning what I was actually doing. Um, and I've been coaching ever since. And in 2003, I became the first woman to become a level five or senior international coach in the United States. And I'm still the only senior international coach. And, of course, Amy is now an international coach, and she's only the second woman um, after me to become international coach. So I went through that same route that she's on now. Amy, my um, wife, for those who yeah, don't Amy know Yeah, Amy Everett. Um, and so, you know, I, I've been a coach for a number of years and uh, like forever. And, um, <laughs> you know, I have a couple of guys that are, you know, on world teams now. And so, I, you know, I'm still coaching at that level. And, um, you know... I run a business and I'm a professor and Greg makes fun of me incessantly because I'm a college professor. I teach government and um, I'm a mother, not a motherfucker, just a mother. Whoa, easy now. I know. You can edit that. No. Or maybe I am. Um, (laughs) So maybe you don't want to edit it. Uh, I think that's all. Is there? Oh, well, I'm on the board of directors. And of course, I have to make this disclaimer. Any comments I make on this podcast and or any podcasts are not reflective of the view of the entire board of directors. It might just be my but, opinion. But perhaps should be. 
maybe, <laughs> but it's probably not since we're not usually unanimous in anything. Um, well, any uh, opinions that I express on this podcast are representative of the opinions of Catalyst Athletics because well, I'm you have, Catalyst Athletics. Yes, yeah, you have that advantage. I am not USA Weightlifting, but um, I'm certainly I'm a long-term member, and, and obviously I've been on the board of directors since uh, 2009, and uh, am currently the chair of the board of directors, but that's neither here nor there. The non-gender specific chairperson. Yes, I am Madam President. And also, uh, your te- men's team won the national championships in 2014. That's correct. Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I have a men's team called Texas Barbell Club. Did I forget about that? I I maybe it was because I just wasn't paying attention to you, but I think no, you skipped I over. I didn't I didn't forget them. <clears throat> they they dominate my life actually. Yes. Yes. Well, and that's that's what we need to talk about, isn't it? Weightlifting yep. life, the name of the podcast, but also the name of our lives. So yeah, when we were trying to come up with a name for the podcast. I was like, you know, this is the simplest common denominator between Greg and I is that we both live the weightlifting life, which is just, you know, your whole lifestyle is based on the sport of Olympic weightlifting. The decisions you make in life with family, with friends, who your friends are, where you travel to, where your vacations are, what, what you mean you know, vacation. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, the thing that happens the day after the national you know, championships right. or the day after everybody's done competing at the world, that's your vacation. Yes. Um, like just how everything in our lives, it just revolves around, um, the sport of Olympic weightlifting, the discussions you have, the statistics, you know, I don't know shit about any other sport. Like people ask me questions or, Oh, are you watching the basketball finals? I don't even know when they are. Um, yeah. Yeah. How I, many innings are there in a basketball game? Uh, <laughs> Stupid. Uh, no, I mean, I I know basic stuff, Greg. Don't call me an idiot. But uh, <laughs> I did not call you an idiot. You, <laughs> you presumed yourself to be an idiot. Well, yeah. And I might be in, in most sports, but, like, I don't know who's – I remember there was a guy on TV, and I asked my husband who it was, and he looked at me just in shock, and he goes, LeBron? <laughs> and I was like, oh, yeah, I knew I recognized him. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Yeah, no, well, I'm just, uh, I mean, even uh, just getting this podcast off the ground has taken uh, three months uh, because of various commitments and and. Yeah, that uh, discussion was in March. It was at the, when we were in Dallas doing the seminar, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. It was in March. Yeah, that was a while ago. <laughs> Maybe. So is it what is it? July? Yeah, mid July. <laughs> so. Yeah, hopefully but th- but this isn't the only one for the next three months. We'll yeah, actually no, we'll do better than this. But, I mean, we were both waiting for our weightlifting life to slow down and enough so that we could commit to doing it long term. I mean, of course, I was still teaching, um, and that kind of was taking up some time. And I was teaching summer school, too. But, you know, we had nationals coming up, and we're both preparing a team. And then I was supposed to be the meet director for youth nationals, which happened to fall during the same weekend as the beginning of junior worlds. And then I had to go to Tbilisi, Georgia, um, to function as the IWF delegate. And I had to go to Pan Am's in Columbia and sweat to death. Yeah. Well, I sweated to death too. When we were in Georgia, the first two nights, and this is Tbilisi, Georgia, not the state. (laughs) um, You're going to sweat in either one of those places. It would have been worse if we were in the state because we had two nights with no air conditioning. And, you know, Phil was a trooper. He didn't bitch at all. I managed to get a fan delivered to my room by some girl who lives in Katy, Texas. I was just, I, you know, I bitched enough about it apparently on Facebook <laughs> that they're like, oh, well, we'll bring you a fan. And I mean, somebody, I don't know, some Georgian mafioso, I guess, I don't know. Somebody like delivered me a fan. It was, I was very grateful. But, um, you know, we were both, the point is, we were both out doing weightlifting stuff and, trying to organize our lives in a way that we could fit one more weightlifting thing into our agenda. Yes. And here it is. Here it is. So we've carved both, uh, you know, committed to carving out time to uh, answer as many questions as we can. All right. Well, so you wanted to continue on that thread of uh, well, I, I what think the weightlifting that, you know, life truly is. Yeah. I think, um, you know, when we were thinking about, you know, why Greg and I are even friends? It's it's because we both live the same lifestyle, right? And, and why we're both we're, incredible. 
well, there's that, but most people don't realize that. No. At least it's about you. And um, <laughs> That's fair. Yeah, Ur- but, Ursula's the, the more intelligent, more successful, better looking version of me. I'm just glad that you put better looking. And of course, your gender opposite. Well, yeah, but. Uh, but I, uh, so all those other things may not be true. I just may be the female version of Greg Everett. But I have no writing talent, so that can't be true. Okay, fair enough. But when we were looking at, you know, the things that we have in common, like why Greg and I quickly became really good friends, um, mostly because we think alike, but, uh, you know, the things that we commiserate about or that we have in common are all because we have based our lives on the sport of Olympic weightlifting from the moment that we found out about it, because that's the way it is. Like you're infected. It's like a disease. It, it is in many virus. ways a disease. You can't you can't get rid of it. Even if you try to go somewhere and act like you don't have it, it still lives in you. You like <laughs> harbor it. And uh, you're and so not started, always in the middle of an outbreak, but it's always there. <laughs> right, it's always there. <laughs> you had to say outbreak. Oh, um, but you know, some of the examples that I was thinking of, like what what are these things that that differentiate our lives from really other people that we know that we generally don't include in our lives because they don't share these things. And one of the first things that came up was how we put weightlifting in front of holidays. And I think we've all been particularly affected with this, you know, like worlds being the same time as Thanksgiving or around the same time as Thanksgiving. Um, and Greg particularly has his, his problem with the Arnold. Um, yeah, well, th- yeah, there was a string, I think, of about five years where I was in Columbus, Ohio, getting either snowed or rained on uh, and, w- you know, being surrounded by a bunch of gigantic muscular women and their little skinny dork boyfriends following them around uh, through the convention center at the Arnold because it was the same weekend of my birthday every year. Um, and but, that's going to be uh, your birthday. Like as long as there is a trials yeah. or a nationals or a, it's a qualifier, Greg's birthday will be spent in that, you know, location because yeah, thanks, thanks Arnold for choosing yeah, that's March the, in Mark. Ohio. Good <laughs> job. You couldn't have done like fall or something or spring a little <laughs> bit later. Yeah. Spring would have been better at least. So we don't get that combination of snow and rain. Cause that's always nice to have when you're, yeah. I actually did wreck a car there. <laughs> Don't don't admit that people are. Well, just I mean, that was say, the last accident woman, I had. Know how to drive. And I've convinced everybody else that I do know how to drive. But I will admit that I did have a little fender bender uh, because of the rain and snow combination. I'm from Texas. I don't know how to drive in the freaking snow. Are you kidding? We had an American Open in Dallas, and there was an ice storm. That's an ice storm. We don't drive. Did you see anybody on the road? Uh, we don't drive. Yeah, when it, I was on you know, the road. Texas I had to go to the airport to get the fudge out of there. Yeah, y'all were the only possible. people driving. All the Texans were in their houses. Like Amateurs. we, we, our, our cities closed down when it snowed. <laughs> I went, almost well, when it, it rained. I, I think I, I don't know that that many people have had the uh, the issue with the worlds being during Thanksgiving because that's a that's a pretty select few. I mean, that's fifteen people plus a couple coaches in the country each year. Well, uh, I, but, I had like three years in a row. Yeah, but I mean, but look, the other thing is we have the American Open. Yeah, that's convention. the one that gets everybody because that's you're going to have the most people there. And so that's, you know, the week after Thanksgiving. So you have uh, I think it affects women disproportionately for than men. I think you it's, just called it all fat. You, it, no, I just <laughs> said they, they'd have to tend to cut weight a little more. Uh, and so you have a lot of weightlifters having miserable Thanksgivings because they can't just eat whatever they want because they've got to make weight one week later. I, ha- I know uh, my good friend Mike Gray, who coaches down at Outlier Barbell in San Diego, um, he made one of his lifters uh, have Thanksgiving with him instead of going home to her family to make sure that she could <laughs> just make, make sure weight. she didn't have potatoes and stuffing. Well, you know what? She made weight and she had a great meat, so he wins. <laughs> Well, she wins too. Uh, (laughs) We we all win. Both winners. We all win when we just eat little slivers of turkey on Thanksgiving. Yeah, I mean, you know, that was one of the things when I quit competing, I stopped having to make weight, which is probably not a good thing for me in life. (laughs) But and I remember like the first Thanksgiving after 
thinking, oh man, I can eat stuffing and gravy. And this is great. Like this Thanksgiving thing is the best. You just teed um, off on everything on that table, didn't you? Oh, sure. Yeah. And you had some of everything that you hadn't eaten in years. But, (laughs) you know, in in the years that I had like Thanksgiving in another country, uh, one year particularly sticks out. And I was there as a coach. This was 08, I believe. Um, And it was in Canada. And I mean, when are you in your life going to have... Um, and of course it happens more often in weightlifting, but we were at the under 17, under 15, 16, I don't know, it was some youth team. And it was like Jared Fleming and his parents and the Corbins and Matt Fraser, Sage Bergner, Caleb Ward. Like that's who we had Thanksgiving with. And <laughs> I think the Flemings and Corbin splurged by a uh, Thanksgiving dinner. So, I mean, like this is your family for that Thanksgiving and it's all these, you know, youth weightlifters and it's, you know, it's awesome. At the same time, you're thinking, you know, I wonder what my family's doing, (laughs) like my, you know, actual blood family, but you spend, you know, as many Thanksgivings with them and, and, but you readily accept that there may be an occasion, um, or more where weightlifting is going to take precedence and it doesn't really phase you. Like, I think your family may look at it differently, but as a lifter and for other lifters, it's like, eh, you're going to miss Thanksgiving. Well, you can go next year and right. and spend it with your family. Like you see the opportunities that weightlifting presents as really the most important part of your life. Well, and, and, and you made the, the, the really important point earlier before we started recording that there is a, unfortunately, very short window of opportunity uh, to be an athlete and in particular a weightlifter. Uh, and you can take advantage of that and enjoy Thanksgiving and Christmas and your birthday uh, for the remaining years of your life. Uh, most likely there'll be many more. And, you know, what that, that's, a, that's a very small sacrifice for a huge payoff, in my opinion. Right, and I right. think that's what really distinguishes, uh, one of the things that distinguishes a, a great lifter, a great athlete from a recreational one is that you have your priorities in that order and you're willing to make sacrifices like that. And it's not that big of a deal. You don't wring your hands about it and cry about it for a month. Uh, You go do what you need to do and and you enjoy it. Well, and you're really grateful that you develop, you have those memories. Like, you know, a lot of my memories in my life are really based on, you know, well, we were in this country or we were in that country or we were at this meet or we were at that meet. Like some of the most significant memories, you know, some of your best and worst party moments (laughs) are with. Mostly worse. (laughs) Yeah. But are, well, are, and you know what, that, that, that makes me think actually, uh, two, two weekends ago, Amy and I were down in San Diego, um, for our coaches, uh, Mike Bergner's, uh, surprise 70th birthday party. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so that was one of those things where we got to sit around and reminisce and, and kind of tell stories about, um, our experiences, you know, with coach Bergner and, and kind of lifting in that environment and, it was really, uh, um, I mean, it, it became family, uh, for Amy in particular. I mean, she had been training with him since she was 18 years old. Uh, so he's, you know, Bergner is basically her, her father. Uh, and you know, you, you look back at it and so much of, of our lives has, uh, you know, been completely intertwined with, with his life and, and with, that location. And I mean, I met her his family, through him. You know? I met my wife through him yeah. and you know what I mean? So it's in, we found out years later that he was actually, actually trying to set us up, but. Oh, well, sure. No, I mean, that's part of a coach's job. <laughs> you know, I have this hashtag Texas barbell genome project. I've been working on this for like a decade. And Developing it's the bearing... biologically oh, yeah. Yeah. most suitable people. Absolutely. Sure. It's not? totally bearing fruit. You would be you irresponsible got, like, not to. I would be completely remiss. Um, but you know, we've got the whole goad clan with, uh, uh, Sydney and little Dean yeah. and Ruby Lynn. Like those are all, I, I consider the, the fruits of my labor. Um, of <laughs> course I did nothing in, in their actual upbringing except for encourage the initial pairing of their parents. Um, and I'm waiting for Ella, just Jody and Chad's baby. Mm-hmm. Like I'm everywhere that I can, so I see a suitable pairing like Court and Colin, I'm all over that. 
I'm like, yes, this is y'all are the best thing ever. They do seem to both like uh, pet pigs, so that's, yeah, that's an important. No, they're they're uh, totally well suited otherwise. To relationship. But I, I'm not even sure that that would matter to me because what I see is an incredible female athlete and an incredible male athlete that like each other enough. <laughs> yeah. And well, so I they're going to make them. a baby with uh, great short femurs and mobility. So it's, it's, yeah, gonna be, no, I'm, it's I'm, gonna be I'm waiting. So well, no that, pressure, no that, pressure. That's another one we talked about is uh, with regard to weightlifting life is the, the choice of your significant other. Sure. Uh, yeah. You know, I married a weightlifter. You married a weightlifter. I married one that I divorced him because he was from Belarus and we had nothing in common, but except weightlifting. <laughs> it worked for a little while. Yeah, the bad part is we didn't actually have any offspring, so there's no like my genome project could have started there. Uh, I mean, I could I could have walked the walk. I did not. I'll admit. Yeah, sometimes, um, sometimes you have to maintain more of a managerial position. <laughs> that's right. You got to manage this you, project. Yeah, you had to delegate. Yeah, I you can't, can't get you involved. You can't have with it. all the babies yourself. No, no. You you get you would get less done that way. That's right. But, uh, you know, it, it's a matter of um, I don't know that it's entirely possible to be as successful as possible, uh, you know, as an athlete, if you are attached to somebody who is not involved in that sport, because there's no possible way for them to understand the rationale for your sacrifices and your unwillingness right. to go to a party or, you know, go out Friday night and go drinking because you've got to train Saturday morning or, you know, whatever the case is, missing holidays, traveling to these seemingly, you know, Peoria, Illinois. No one wants to go there, like but the if most there's a national undesirable championship places on there, earth and we're all going right? happily. Yeah, exactly. Hanging out in like a, you know, a, a TGI Fridays or something, um, trying to find food that's edible. Uh, and so, you know, without that, it's, it becomes, it's like an anchor tied around your ankle. I mean, you, you just can't go as far as you possibly can if you're constantly well, it, trying to it becomes to an, an obstacle or impediment. You. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you having to explain, and I see it sometimes in relationships. And of course, as a coach, you know, that we have probably a little bit, you know, more significance to our athletes than, you know. Uh, you would expect, but you know, when you spend, like you, you said, you know, Amy has been with Mike as her coach, like her, her whole life, essentially her whole adult life. I have athletes that their entire adult lives, you know, they're in their mid thirties now, and I've been coaching them since they were 18. Um, so you have, uh, you know, a lot of influence in, in the relationships they to, do develop. And of course you're encouraging them to find people who support them and, much of the time that comes in the form of another weightlifter. So as much as it's, you know, I, you know, we joke about it being a genome project, which is really actually not a joke, but you know, I try to <laughs> laugh at it. Um, you, you want to make sure that whoever their significant other is, is going to support what they do. I've seen so many times where, you know, one of my athletes, her boyfriend or a guy that I'm coaching, you know, his girlfriend are getting mad at them or they start a fight every time they go to a competition or they're pissed off that they're going to be gone for a week to train or a week to compete. And you're like, you know, this, this is, well, first of all, it's not good. They should support whatever you're doing, but you know, it'd be so much easier if you just dated a weightlifter. <laughs> well, yeah. And, and not only do you have the, the normal stress and aggravation of being in a fight with your girlfriend or boyfriend, but it, it ends up completely destroying and disrupting the training and the competition. Mm -hmm. So it, it's it's just all bad. And it's it's bad for the other person, too. If they're the kind of person who can't stand to uh, allow their boyfriend or girlfriend, husband, wife, wh whoever, to go uh, do what they want to do, then they're going to be miserable for the entire relationship anyway. So Well, we've all seen like our one of our athletes dating someone. You're like, that person is just not well suited for your lifting career. Yeah. You know, and, and you just, you don't want to tell them like they, you shouldn't be with them, but you're certainly, you know, give them the indication that that person is not well suited to your, you know, eventual success. This and, is going and just, to be bad. Yeah. This is going to be bad for you. And, and you see their performance, like literally see their performance improve whenever they lose that. I have, I'm so lucky because I have what I call a Texas barbell wives club. And one of the reasons I um, did that was because I want to make sure that all of those wives, f number one, realize that I realize 
that they're giving up time with their husbands so that their husbands can follow a dream. And not all of them are going to be national champions, but they're all important in contributing to the team and form of, you know, support and team points and all that kind of stuff. And a lot of them, you know, are becoming coaches. And, you know, there is some small benefit that goes back to them and that they're, you know, they can go out and coach people and make a little bit of money um, on the side or whatever. But, you know, I realize that they're all making big sacrifices and that, you know, their support is really important to the success of our team. So, yeah. you know, I, I, I try as much as I can to reach out to them, to know them, um, to include them in things when we can, um, and, you know, to really make them understand that we know that there's a sacrifice that, that they're making with their significant others whenever they're kind of allowing them to pursue this career as an athlete in weightlifting because it just it takes up a disproportionate amount of your time in life um, compared to all of the other things because you know it starts to rule every aspect you know how you eat your sleep where you can work how much you work um, and we talked a little bit about that about you know the fact that we pick jobs based on Am I going to be able to train? Yeah. No. Yeah. And I, you know, the example would be, you know, my wife, Amy, when she was in the peak of her career, she was, you know, working as a server in, in kind of uh, like fine dining restaurants because it was the only way that she could work few enough hours uh, and still make enough money to support herself uh, that would allow full time training and wouldn't, right. wouldn't force her to relocate from where her coach and gym was. And that's so common. A lot, I know a lot of female athletes that that's exactly what they do. They're waitresses in high-end restaurants because they can make a good amount of money um, and then they still have time to sleep and train. Right. I worked in gyms, so I was just broke. Yeah. But, but I could train. Well, and but know? that's the other part of it is that there are a great number of lifters who are just kind of resigned to living on borderline poverty Mm-hmm. Um, in order, I'm not to, even sure I was borderline. I think it was. I'm sure I crossed. You threshold. qualified. Yeah. Uh, it, it well, it's it's like poverty threshold um, plus the ability to afford some supplements and, and right, stuff like right. that. And so. you still have to. And of course, you know, no matter how broke you are, you have an illegal bar. Right. Like, oh, I mean, yeah. that's just. But you only have to buy thing. one of those your whole life. Right. And it, right. It's going to last. So that's that's an investment. <laughs> that's like that's like owning real estate. <laughs> Uh, so true. So, uh, you know, looking at that and then the other one we talked about, of course, was um, being willing to relocate your entire mm-hmm. life, for example. And I get this from people, you know, uh, there's a lot more people out there now um, who are wanting to learn weightlifting and be weightlifters and, and do these kind of things. And the, the, the one we always get is, well, there's no coaches around me. I want to be a great weightlifter, but there's no coaches in my area. Well, guess what? There weren't any coaches in my area either, and so I moved. Uh, and so that's the perfect example of, um, you know, determining on, on you know, what what is your actual goal? How far do you really want to take this? And based on that, how dedicated are you willing to right. become? What sacrifices are you willing to make? I sold my share of a gym business uh, got rid of a nice house in order to move down to San Diego to train with Mike Bergner. Um, basically with not entirely sure how I was going to make money. I just said, this is what I'm going to do. Uh, and thankfully it, it ended up working out for me. Um, but I, I mean the first like two or three months that I was there, uh, I was living in my coach's sister-in-law's uh, house while they were waiting to tear it down uh, to do remodeling. So I was basically house sitting and taking care of their dog so I could live for free. Uh, you know, so, you know, you, you make sacrifices, you make compromises and things like that because that's the only way that you can achieve what you're trying to achieve. If your response to everything is, well, that's inconvenient. Guess what? You're not going anywhere. Well, and I think that's what that's whole lifestyle is that willingness to make sacrifices yeah. To try to either become the best coach you can be, the best athlete you can be. Um, and, you know, one of my athletes that got second at American Open, she got third or second at National, she got third at last American Open. Her name is Vanessa Frost. She was down here um, interviewing for several different jobs. She's a strength coach. And she ended up getting a job at Pflugerville Fire Department 
as their uh, like fitness coordinator, but she moved from Illinois to Texas to train with me. Yeah. And so, I mean, this, this just happened. Like, and nobody thinks twice about it. Like she didn't think twice about it. That's what I was coaching her. She was one of the only athletes I had remote because I just really don't do much of that unless I can spend a significant amount of time with you or I already have. Right. Um, but she was really talented and, and I knew that I could manage to help her. But I mean, I'm not saying I put pressure on her to move down here, but certainly <laughs> I made it known that if you want me to do my best job, then I need to see you. And I mean, honestly, she never really said boo about it. She just went about her business and got it done. Yeah. And so, you know, I have other athletes that, you know, maybe aren't as good as her yet, but I tell them, if you want me to help you the best that I can help you, then I need to see you. And, and then, you know, they end up moving. You know, the other thing we talked about um, in moving was like in the process of moving, this happened to me a bunch of times. I, the first thing you always set up is your garage. And I noticed when y'all were moving to Oregon that all the pictures I've seen so far are the garage. Like you haven't shown me that you've even unpacked the house. Yeah, I mean, and, the, ho- the house is all right, but the garage is bitching. Yeah, right. No, it's the first thing you set up. Like before you even go and start packing, you know, taking things out of boxes and putting them in drawers, you're over there measuring the slope of the garage so you can build a shim, so you can build your platform, so you can start training the next day. Like yeah. and I noticed Vanessa and them did the same thing. Like the first pictures we saw of her house were the garage. Yeah, um, Like the first thing you set up when you move. And, and I mean, I've known so many weightlifters, and me included, that uh, at one point in time, this is a real kind of benchmark of a lifter. Uh, you have had one of the rooms in your home set up with a platform. Like for me, it's been my my dining room in different houses because I'm short and like the you know overhead. You can uh, you can snatch kind of a right. jerk under a chandelier. Right, pretty much. <laughs> um, that's not for everybody, but uh, or you just move it to the side. You know, you put a hook and you pull the chandelier to the side yeah. so that you have headroom. But uh, I, I even just recently at 46 years old, I had two back extensions in what is supposed to be my dining room because I was preparing to move back into my garage to train. We ended up getting a place. So now I have a dining room again. But when I was in you know, my mid 20s, there was an extended period of time where I not too extensive because a garage is kind of you're always looking for a place with a garage. But I didn't have a garage. And so my dining room was uh, set up with a platform barbell and, and weights and a squat rack. Like, you know, people walk into your house and, you know, anybody that should be in your house wouldn't even blink at it. But people that you kind of newer people are like, what the hell? Yeah. And you're like, what, what, you know, that's, that's normal. Yeah. I had, it, uh, it I had one, I had a spare like, bedroom and an apartment that was all set up for lifting. And when I lived in Arizona, I had this little, uh, guest house I was renting and that was what my living room was. I didn't have any furniture. I had, you know, the power rack and everything set up in there. And then I had uh, this tiny little desk made of a piece of plywood and some milk crates off to the side, you know, that, <laughs> making sure that it was out of the way of the, the lifting stuff. Of the weights. Right, right, right. Can't get anything, put anything on the platform. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't think my, and any of my cars have actually ever been in the garage. I mean, I would try to arrange the garage in case a hailstorm came. I could maybe drive the car in. And I can remember once trying to, you know, like spinning my wheels, trying to get the car into the platform that was like, you know, five layers of plywood thick because I put a bunch of rubber so that it would, you know, uh, limit the noise and the, right. the shock to the pla- to the to foundation. Yeah. But well- I was going to say, when we moved here, we had this giant garage, which is one of the main reasons we chose this house. You know, when we decided right. to move, we well, the the one of the main criterion was that we had to either have a big enough garage to use as a gym, or we had to have property where we could build an outbuilding for a gym. Right. You know that that those were that's a deal breaker right there. Right. Yeah. Um, you walk in the garage, it's the wrong setup. You're like, mm, can't fit more yeah, than three. Yeah. Ceiling's platforms. too low. Kind of whatever. Good. Yeah. So we we got the uh, the garage floor leveled because of course you know garages are built with a slope for drainage. Can't put a platform on that uh, if you don't want to die. But 
you know, and the, the guy's looking at us like, you know, are you, you sure you want to do this? You know, like they put, they build slopes into garages for a reason. Like, yeah, no, I understand that. We're not parking cars in here. We're, we're building a gym. Ever. Like, I don't Ever. give a shit if it's flat. So, so now, you know, the, the front of our garage, there's like a, a three inch lip, uh, you know, where it's been leveled. And so you, you, could theoretically drive into it, except there are plate racks in the way. So it's never going to happen. Yeah. No, nobody, a garage isn't a garage for a weightlifter. Yeah. A garage is a weight room for a weightlifter. Right. And you look at the house and you buy the house and that's like all considered before. I just, I'm still kicking myself in the ass that I didn't buy a three car garage. Um, rookie, I was in such mistake. a hurry. Yeah, I know. Rookie mistake. I was in such a hurry because my other house sold so quickly yeah. that I had like two weeks to find a house. And uh, because I was going to Comotini, Greece to coach a team. So, of course, then I just pretty much gave power of attorney over to my mother and said, buy this house for me. <laughs> well, that, <laughs> and it, left the, the country. The garage gym is tough depending on where you live, too. In Texas, it's about, what, 300 degrees in the summer? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. So yeah, you can, like, cook your innards. Yeah. But, you know, I've had some outrageous air conditioning bills. When Sam and Tom lived with us, we, they, you know, Sam would train twice a day. And so... Um, and she would, you know, try to open the garage door, but it, I was like, it's worse. Just, you know, we would air condition from the air conditioning in the house and our air conditioning bills were, would skyrocket. We'd set up a fan. I had like a little, um, air conditioning unit that was portable that I actually got from Chad and Jody that we would use to try to cool the garage down to like 90 <laughs> <laughs> to train. And it was, it was, um, but you know, you don't, that, if that's what you have to do, that's what you have to do. I prefer, I'm a little bit of a diva. Like I like air condition. Um, I think it's an indoor sport and indoor sport should have air conditioning. It's just kind of my I, philosophy. I, <laughs> so. I go, I go back and forth on that. So me as a human being, air conditioning is probably at the, the, in the top three, uh, inventions by humans of oh, all sure. history. And flushing toilets. Yeah. I, I'll, I'll take air conditioning over indoor plumbing, but, uh, be just, I, I just run hot and, yeah, uh, but I think that's it, a weightlifter. I think weightlifters it, are kind of hot, just too much yeah, muscle. Typically why well, I, I don't too much muscle is not my problem, but too much uh, fat. It, yeah. Too much something. <laughs> a good combination sure. of both. That's <laughs> what I have. Uh, but, uh, you know, then you, you end up in say some competition situation where the back room has no airflow, yeah. it's just full of bodies. Uh, you got a bunch of dipshits who aren't supposed to be back there putting even more body heat into it. Or, you know, you end up in Georgia or Columbia and it's 150% humidity and 98 degrees. You know, the heat index is 120 and you feel like you're going to, you know, die in a, a puddle of this screaming, like melted flesh. Uh, and you, in those situations, you kind of go, well, maybe sometimes I should let the gym be a little uncomfortable. Right, hot. right. Sometimes. So, yeah, we, we try to do that. You know, our, our previous facility was air conditioned. And let me tell you, 16 foot ceilings, 5,000 square feet. That's a pretty gnarly air conditioning bill. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the, the new garage, there's no air conditioning. It gets pretty warm here, but uh, we, we keep the doors open and it's 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 actually not that bad. Uh, in the winter, it'll get down to the 20s, but we do have a little bit of heating in there, so we'll be all right. So in the winters, you bring your bars inside, right? They're like animals. No. That's the thing. Like, you have to know, like, in the winter, and, and it, even in Texas, in the winters, we bring our bars inside, like, inside the house. Oh, because yeah, the garage see. gets so cold that you can't hold the bar. Yeah. We, like, that's such a rookie mistake. I see people that they're like, oh, my God, I can't hold the bar. It's so cold. I'm like, why don't you bring your bar inside? Well, we don't we we don't have to worry about that. The garage is heated well enough, but that does remind me. Uh, Kara Doherty, formerly Kara Yessi, um, who's one of our lifters, who's kind of retired now, but multiple time Canadian national champion, great lifter. When she started lifting, they trained in a barn, and she's from Sarnia, which is near Toronto, uh, and so it was freezing butt ass cold up there in the winter, and they would have to get a blowtorch to warm the bar up before they could train during the winter. So if, if you're in your, I live in your Texas, gym and it's, six, it's 65 degrees and you're whining about it being too cold to train, you probably need to <laughs> shut your mouth. It actually gets cold in Texas. Well, and it's not even that it has to be that cold. Like the bar, bars get, you know, they, they get super cold. Like you try to... Well, they're made of metal. Well, thank you, Greg, for pointing that out. They're great conductors. You're so smart. 
this is why I had to talk you into doing this. Yeah. Um, no, what was some of the other things that we talked about? We talked about the rooms in the house. Greg and I kind of, you know, looked at and, and have had random discussions about stuff like this. The kids, like oh, yeah. my, my son, and this is related to both garage and family, but, you know, my son grew up. Like, you know, his, his I, I've changed his diaper in a garage. I mean, not everybody's happy about that. I, you know, fe- I would feed him, not breastfeed, for by the way, just like feed him out of a bottle <laughs> in the garage, just for the record. Settle down, hippie. Yeah, right. Well, I'm in Austin. Uh, and, you know, he spent like his toddler days, you know, learning how to sit down between people's attempts and then getting his own attempt, which would be jumping over bars and scaling the squat rack. Um, mm-hmm. But he'll to this day and he's 11 he'll open the garage door and take a big woof you know like inhale the air from the garage and then close the garage door and go i love that i love that smell and i'm like you love that smell and there's now because he grew up in a garage there's this sense that you know the 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 smell brings back this nostalgia for him about his, you know, his youth. Of course, he's still really young, but right back in the olden days, um, he was a kid. Greg, did I lose you? No. Hello. Hello. I lost you. I don't know why. That Did we go over time? That was rude of you to hang up on me. I don't me. know where it broke up. Hold on. Let me call my son real quick before you start recording this again. Okay. Because as I was talking about him, he called. And he's in Colorado Springs with his dad. Hi. Are, is everything okay? Okay. That was yesterday, sweetie. I called you yesterday. Thanks for calling me back. Okay. Well, let me call you back because I'm in the middle of doing a podcast. Okay. Love you. Okay. Bye, baby. Okay. I was just making sure, like, my husband didn't go into a diabetic home or something. That's probably a good idea. I know. Such a stress. <laughs> All right. Th- where are we at? You were talking about your son's nostalgia for the smell of a garage. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, mine is fresh cut grass I smell it and it reminds me of when I was a child for him it's the smell of rubber wood and weights of a garage and that seems kind of it's it's sad and awesome at the same time you know I because he, he's that's like sad. I well I mean mine's fresh cut grass that seems like a good thing like I was outdoors or something I mean he was in a garage <laughs> well yeah but it's, it's not like you're saying that he gets nostalgic for the smell of a, a video game controller or something no that yeah no his association with his childhood is the smell of a garage which is um directly related to you know him growing up with a mother that spent her life coaching in a garage yeah well um, and our daughter just, grew up in in Mike Bergner's garage and then our gym uh, you know, since she was born and she's 14 now. So she's always been in a gym. Her whole Is life. she lifting now? Cause that's one of the things like, you know, a lot of coaches, you see the coaches that, um, I saw Danny had just posted something like his daughter was just asking about training. My son has gone in and out. Um, yeah, our, ours think- is not interested. She, she did one youth nationals and then she said she retired. I think mine, my, I feel like my son's had two careers. One was like 18 months to two years old <laughs> because he was doing like muscle power, you know, like power yeah. snatches with a close grip um, for that time frame, just on his own. But literally like would plop the pacifier, put it down and then go get chalk. Um, and then again, when he was like nine or 10, it went for like a little bit longer period of time. And he competed at a couple of, you know, like a state meet and a couple of local meets. And then he was over it. And so I, I told him, you'll be back because he's a kid, you know, he's a boy. So I'm like, you know, at some point he's going to want to be muscular. Yeah. And so he'll, I, I have a feeling he'll come back and at least train some. But he walked into the gym the other day and I, I told him today you're going to lift. And uh, one of the other guys I trained that just has a hard time learning snatch and clean and jerk. And it's not, you know really really good he's he's kind of mediocre he he looks at my son and my son puts some weights on the bar and then just starts snatching and he's like of course of course he can fucking snatch i quit 
Yeah, yeah. He's like, and then he does clean a jerk, and he's like, well, fuck. Like, yeah. this little eleven year old kid wanders in and just, you know, with impeccable technique, starts snatching and cleaning and jerking. I was like, well, you know, he's kind of got a little bit of an advantage. He's really been around it his whole life. Yeah, I mean, Jade. Jade used to hang out in the garage, and she would, you know snatch a clean and jerk PVC pipe or like little five pound dumbbells, stuff like that. And it was all just kind of through imitation. Right. Uh, right. That's and, totally. Yeah. She, she does not want to learn from us. She will not listen to anything Amy or I tell her and that's fine. Like I have no interest in pushing her into weightlifting and she, you know, she was a competitive gymnast up until last year. Uh, and now, you know, she's been doing track and field as long as she's doing some kind of sport, even right. though those sports aren't as good as weightlifting, then I'm happy. <laughs> Which is no sport. Right, that's what I'm um, saying. I mean, there's no comparison. No, um, yeah, we've we've not really pushed him at all. And I think, you know, most good coaches don't. You know, you want we, – we all know that, you know, the, the recipe for success in weightlifting includes a really inherent desire and will to do the sport because – like we said, you're going to have to make sacrifices and it takes, you know, an incredible level of discipline and dedication to the sport to succeed. And so why would you want to try to push someone to do something if it's just if it's not inherent? Well, I think we all you just... were a failure in your own life and you need to live vicariously <laughs> through your child. That's why I will. Come on. Never thought never of seen that. that before. <laughs> see it all the time. But yeah, it, that's absolutely true. Yeah, I don't if, coach if those don't, kids. No, of course. When not. I see but that, you if know, you I don't see truly love it, him, I'm like, nah. Yeah, if you don't truly love it, if that's not truly what you want to do more than anything else, then you're not going to be that successful anyway. So right. you might as well just give it up. Yeah, or I'll let them do something else that they do enjoy. And uh, so there are a couple more things we were talking about, you know, in terms of lifestyle. And I think girls in particular that, you know, you'll see them make posts about, um, you know, I have, I, you, you know, I've said this comment, too. Um, people are like, oh my God, you're wearing clothes. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> yeah. well, I don't walk around nude, you know, to the people around me, but you know, your entire wardrobe is like either coaches gear or lifting gear. And so like when an occasion comes up, you're like, oh shit. Yeah. <laughs> I don't even, I, you know, I don't even fit in a dress because I, you know, you have broad shoulders and like, they, they don't even, I mean, now they're starting to make clothes for a weightlifting, a weightlifters build for women. But before, like all of your, and because you would be moving around in weight classes, like all of your clothes needed to stretch. Right. <laughs> well, so Amy, had, Amy has a 63 kilo wardrobe and a 69 kilo wardrobe. I mean, you have to. Yeah. Because, you know, you're, you're one when you're training and you're another when you're competing. And so, and you, you know, if you decide not to cut weight for that meat, you got to still wear clothes, Greg. Yeah, well, that's um, true. But even for guys, finding finding actual like grown up pants grown uh, up. that fit is damn near impossible. Um, actually, th the best thing is I went to we had some I, th I think it was you know what? I bet it was Jess Lucero's wedding and uh, I had to go pick up a few things. And so I'm in Nordstrom and, you know, there's a guy come over to help me. And uh, I tell him my measurements and he's looking at me. He's like, no, no, I, I don't think so. You're this and this. I'm like, listen, dude, I'll, I'm fucking telling you, like, I don't care if you believe me or not. And so he goes and gets me the things that he thinks will fit me. Didn't even get it. It couldn't fit ha like past my knee over my clothes. Yeah, no, and I like don't even have that pants. big of legs. And I came back and explained to him, I'm like, do you believe me now? Like, come look at this, you little fucker. Uh, you know, you and your skinny jeans, cause you've got a, a leg that'll fit through the diameter of a PVC pipe. But, uh, and, and so, it, but it's difficult because to get pants that will fit, that aren't stretchy. Cause I don't wear stretchy pants cause I'm not a woman, uh, that fit <laughs> over your legs and your butt and also fit your waist is next to impossible. You, you well, end up in like in this stretchy, pair of pants that's like a are bucket. the best invention ever. I'm sorry that you won't <laughs> go ahead and partake. One time my my sister in law said to my asked me, she's like, are those stretchy jeans? And my husband just goes, of course they are. She can't wear any other kind. <laughs> and I was, you know, at once offended and then agreed because that's true. Like, why would I buy pants that don't stretch? Yeah. Like, and, and I wanted to look at him and say, well, that's because I have quads, but I just left it alone. That's um, because I'm better than you. Yeah, it's because I squat that I have to wear stretchy jeans. Yes. So like your whole wardrobe and, and you know, what – and then you, you know, of course, then you start sharing with all your friends like, oh, my God. You know, I can't tell you how many times I've 
gone somewhere and, you know, one of the girls are like, where did you, buy? like, you finally found something that fits you. Where did you get that? And so then we all have to shop at the same places. And it's just like more of the commonalities in your life. They start to increase because of all these little specific aspects of, of how you live. You know, we all have to eat fairly well. So we share information about that. And so you know, like your whole lifestyle then just develops. And then of course your friendships, um, have to be based on that because it's the the core of your life. Yeah. And so the people that are most heavily involved with you on a daily basis are all from that weightlifting circle. Even, I mean, I have, I, you know, I told you I'm a college professor and I have students, of course, that are, you know, I teach in political science and government and I have colleagues from my school, but I don't hang out really with any of them. Well, you better ever. not hang out with your students. No, I don't hang out with my students. I don't <laughs> hang out with my students and or the other professors, really, um, because I'm in the gym every night. And so if I go anywhere at any point in time, it's going to be with a group of weightlifters. And that's for, you know, like three decades. My whole life and all my friends have been people who understand the sport of weightlifting and understand your dedication to the sport and don't judge you because of that, yeah. because they're in the same boat. Well, first and, and foremost, really I don't go anywhere or do anything. But if I ever well, absolutely I, I'm have to, it's yeah. with other weightlifters or coaches. Sure, sure. Yeah, I'm I'm total homebody. And, you know, it, it makes, um, you know, your prospects really limited <laughs> because yeah. all you have is really the world of weightlifting to choose from, which is actually, as we mentioned before, probably the most appropriate pool to choose from anyways. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the last thing, I, and I don't know if I mentioned this, but um, – you know, major events in life, weightlifters, and, and I, th I remember this specifically with James Tatum. We were at the world championships and he's like yeah. waiting for a phone call because his wife is about to give birth. And of course, we're all kind of beside ourselves like, wow, that's a huge event to miss. But it's totally understandable that you're here competing at the worlds instead of like home with your first child being born. Because as we had mentioned, you know, there's like this window of opportunity to be a successful athlete. And, you know, thing, you know, life is happening, but, you know, there's yeah, you still this window of opportunity. Like you seem to like look at it and think, I mean, I went from um, like within 24 hours of leaving the gym after finishing a coaching session, I gave birth to my child. Like you, you I went straight from the gym to the hospital. <laughs> like you just don't think um, anything about it. Like even major events still maybe impacted by the sport and your discipline and dedication and desire to be successful in the sport tends to pervade everything. And, you know, we all excuse each other. I remember there was a guy at one of our a coaching course that I was teaching and he was waiting for a phone call because his wife was about to go into labor. And like, you know, we were at a CrossFit gym and all the CrossFit girls were kind of like, oh, you're going to miss the birth of your child. And all the weightlifting chicks were like, mm, yeah. You should probably go whenever it calls. You yeah, know, like we've seen right. it before where, you know, you're well, it's weightlifting. It's kind of has precedence over everything. Yeah. Well, you can always have another kid. That kid's going to be around driving you nuts for 18 years or so. So you yeah, have so plenty of opportunities. Nice. You can have kids till you're like 45, uh, at least as a woman, as a guy. You, you're good for like till 70 probably, especially yeah. with all the pharmaceuticals out there. So... Yeah, you know, it's, it's you just gotta uh, order your priorities. <laughs> That's my favorite comment. You can have another child. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, you some people who have like fifteen of them. <laughs> At that point, you can't even keep track of their names, so you're not gonna remember whether or not you saw them be born. And once you've seen one born, you've seen them all. But you'll remember every worlds you compete at. That's for sure. Yeah, they, see, there you and go. Very often, every nationals. Most you, can watch, you can watch a video on childbirth. I used to work on an ambulance. I've seen it. Whatever. It's just biology. Uh, I'm kidding, guys. Don't send me angry emails. God's sake. All you hypersensitive whiners. Can't believe you would say something like that. Well, but it's, you know, and it's just, just uh, unf I mean, you're not the only one who thinks that way. That's the funny part. <laughs> and I know you're, you know, you were kind of in jest, but it's kind of like, yeah. Yeah, I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm partially joking. Yeah. You're like 93% serious. Yeah. 7% joking. <laughs> That's a fair ratio. 
anyways, I think that's uh, those are like some of the major, I think, uh, points that we had discussed. Indeed. Uh, about, yeah, about what the weightlifting life entails. So essentially, if you can relate in part to any of these things Greg and I talked about, then you live the weightlifting life and uh, you're the people we want to hear from. Well, and let me add one more thing, because th- this is the one that I think gets to people, too, is that if you can't necessarily relate to all those things and you're not full meal deal weightlifting life individual, uh, we're not saying you're a bad person. You have nothing valuable to contribute to the world. We're just saying you're in a different situation. So that being said, it's not a value judgment. And also, we're still more than willing and happy to help you out. Uh, So if you want to learn how to snatch for another sport or for CrossFit or just for the goddamn hell of it because you think it looks fun, we can help you out. Uh, If you want to make a world team, go to the Olympics, break an American record. We can help you out, too. So don't feel left out. Uh, You know, it's it's we're not picking and choosing uh, our audience necessarily, but. That's where we're coming from. That's the status of our lives. And that's kind of the, the lens through which we, we view this stuff most of the time. Well, I think more than anything, it shows like our, our the level of dedication that we have to it. So, yes, we are more than an Instagram account. Yeah, we, you know, it's the kind of the, the you walk the walk and, you know, talk the talk. So this, this is the life that we lead. The, the, our lives revolve around the sport of weightlifting. We, you know, once we got involved, we stayed, stayed involved and we've kept it, you know, as kind of the core of our lives as have many people. And, um, you know, we think we have something to share and contribute. Like Greg said to everybody, I was, you know, kind of, I mean, obviously, the people that can commiserate with us are the ones that probably will understand us the most easily and relate to some of what we're talking about. But we definitely don't want to be exclusive in any way and uh, welcome all questions and um, regardless of of the level or your experience. And, you know, what we're trying to do is suck more people into this wonderful weightlifting life. That's what we want to do. Absolutely. Well, so uh, next episode, we'll, we'll get going with a series of questions. Um, oh, so you're saying there will actually be substance? There, well, I mean, <laughs> that's the goal. I'm not promising anything. That's the intention. Uh, so I, we'll have questions and answers. Whether or not that uh, comprises substance will be up for the audience to decide. Uh, but we will get to a lot of these questions. We've got some really good ones. Um, I think and, you already have some rolling in, right? Oh, yeah, I mean, we've got lots. Uh, so, again, if, if you have a question, if you haven't submitted one already, or if you have more that you haven't submitted, catalystathletics.com slash podcast. There's a form you can submit questions to us. Um, if it's something we haven't addressed, uh, if it's a, a, a really good topic, we will definitely choose it eventually. But keep in mind... Um, you know, we haven't even launched this thing yet and I've gotten, uh, a, a huge number of questions. So even if I remember you there are no question, stupid questions, just stupid people. Exactly. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> and we'll, no we'll be glad to point out stupid which ones answers. Yeah. We'll, uh, we can, I, I can answer a stupid question in a smart way, uh, if I'm uh, motivated enough. So, yeah, if you're so inclined, we, yeah, we, we do have some of those that we're going to answer. Um, and like I said, don't worry about your question being too basic, uh, you know, unless it's something really absurd that you could have looked up in 10 seconds on the catalystathletics.com website and you're just too lazy. Uh, that's a stupid question. But for the most part, send them to us. If they don't make the grade, you won't ever hear us answer them and your life will continue exactly as it was before. Um, and if you do send us a question, you're going to get the most incredible answer ever. Your life's problems will be solved and you will, uh, achieve eternal happiness. Does that sound about accurate? Yeah, that's completely not overstated. No, I, I've told you a million times. I don't exaggerate. Yeah, never. (laughs) All right. Well, any final words you want to add? Nope. It's been fun. And, uh, I'm glad that we're, we finally got our shit together. Yeah, now let's see if we can keep it together.
Yeah. Good luck to us. All right, guys. So for those of you uh, listening on this first episode, you get a reward. Go to Catalyst or excuse me, shop.catalystathletics.com and you can use the discount code podcast guide to get 25% off my book, Olympic Weightlifting, a complete guide for athletes and coaches. You're welcome. Uh, All right, guys, we will talk to you in about two weeks. And uh, we'll get a regular schedule going here and and, uh, be posted all over the website. It'll be on iTunes. Uh, We'll post all over social mediums, of course. And uh, we'll be talking to you soon.